Good morning, Breakfast with Bacon fans. I am Dr. Christine Bacon, and I am here with my new best friends, a couple who I have wanted to have on the air for, I don't know, two, three years, and they finally had time for me. I'm just kidding, <laughs> just kidding. They're not rude like that. They, I finally got the invitation and they were finally able to accept. So Greg and Julie Alexander, founders of the Alexander House. I bet you know how they got that name, right? <laughs> and I would, I was thinking of introducing you guys my way, but let me just first of all say thanks for being on the air. And then second ask, what on earth is the Alexander House? Okay, well, the Alexander, well, let me back up and say thank you for thank having you. us on. Absolutely. It's great to be here. But the Alexander House is a result of Julie and I bouncing back from the brink of divorce about some 23 years ago. And uh, in short, we were living our lives based on the ways of the world. Uh, everything for us was all about the jobs we had, how much money we made, but more importantly, uh, how much stuff we could accumulate. And, and interesting enough, we allowed those things in life, the materialistic things to be our source of happiness in our, in our lives, in our relationship. And so, of course, as you know, those things don't bring a long-term happiness, if you will. There's that momentary happiness, then it starts yeah. to fade. And then it was on to the next house, the next car, the next trip, the next whatever, mm -hmm. until after a point in time, we can no longer find that happiness in other things we both started looking for that happiness in other people. So infidelity became a big part of our marriage. And needless to say, when those secrets were discovered, we just simply concluded that, that if we're having to resort to those kind of behaviors in our marriage, then there can't be much of a marriage left. And, and Christina, I don't even know if it's what I wanted, but I went to Julie and I asked her for a divorce. But without hesitating, she immediately agreed as she thought that that's how we were living our life anyway, spiritually divorced. Right. And so we, we made the decision to divorce. And long story short, uh, went to our parish priest, went to a counselor for a $100 history lesson telling us how our relationship was like the Civil War. And maybe we were not meant to be together in the first place. Mm -hmm. We went home and told our two kids, seven and nine at the time, that mom and dad were going to divorce. And despite the fact that they were huddled in the corner, embracing each other, literally crying their eyes out, we just simply dismissed it. Oh, they'll be fine. Mm -hmm. You know, if they grow up and manifest any problems or issues, we'll just send them to counseling. That's what Bob and Sue down the street did, and, and they seem to be okay. And again, just simply illustrating how cold-hearted we were at that point in time. But neither one of us made a move. We continue to coexist in the home together. But one important thing is that we still continue to go to Holy Mass every Sunday. Together and this particular, I'm sorry? Together or separately? Yeah, yeah, to together. Get, together, actually. Uh, with our seven-year-old standing in between us, always trying to force our hands together, oh, poor thing. Yeah. But uh, we had a visiting priest in our parish that summer who filled in for the whole summer for our pastor who went away for continued studies. But this guy was just a great teacher of the faith. Uh, my parents converted to the Catholic faith when I was in the third grade, so I never really had this, this understanding of my Catholic faith. But all of a sudden in his homilies, I'm, I'm just captivated about his teachings and the scripture readings and, and everything else involved. And so Julie and I started meeting with him in between the two mass times. And then we found that he was the tribune of vicar for the diocese. And if we didn't know anything else about our faith, we at least knew that this is a guy that does that annulment thing. So, so maybe God is blessing us with this priest to become a friend because surely he's going to show us how to get out of this marriage get and move forward. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we say ignorance is bliss. Not what a really. blessing. God, you are so good for helping us to destroy yeah, this thing that you thought, put together. Man, this is incredible. He is just blessing us to help us get out so and us as priest. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I tell you, when we went to go see him, he agreed because he thought we were coming by for a social visit. But when we went to his office, this poor man, literally, he was just like blown away because we were on the other side of the desk, just hurling everything. He's done this and she's done this. And I mean, we, we laid it all out and we have done, we did everything wrong you could ever do in a marriage. And we went in there knowing that there's no way there's no hope. We're just, we're just going to get out of this. And we asked him, so what can you do for us? And he said, well, let me ask you a few questions. What is God's plan for marriage? We were like, who? God? Can we talk about plan? him later. This is about us. <laughs> it's about us right now. Exactly. Yeah, all about me. <laughs> yeah. oh, God, what do you mean? Uh, what does the church teach about the sacrament of marriage? Mm, not sure. What does it have to do with us? What are some of the writings of St. Paul and the various Holy Fathers dealing with marriage? We're like, we don't know, Father. I mean, really, you know, we just came here because we wanted you to help us get out of our marriage. But 
you know, do you have anything else that you can just give us to get right. on? He said, well, before you go any further with your decision, I suggest you go home and find the answer to the questions I've asked you. And I was blown away because we were like, well, that, that was a waste of an hour. But thanks be to God, by God's grace, Greg went home and he started to look for the answers or the answers to the questions the priest had asked. Yeah, so I went home, I started a course of scripture and, you know, we hear this great homily every year about St. Paul and Ephesians. So I thought naturally, let me go to Ephesians and see what Paul had to say. That's the one that says that the man is the boss of the wife. So it's a really good place to start. Exactly. Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, I was I was on point when I saw that wives be submissive to your husband. So thought, <laughs> Honey, come here. Look at her red. <laughs> Here's the problem in our marriage. Man. I got this woman who's just not paying attention to me. He loved it. <laughs> and so, uh, so I continued reading. But of course, the next few lines I read was, but husbands love your wives like Christ loved the church. And, and yeah, that was a, a, a door stopper for me. And, and I thought, wow, like, like Christ loved the church. And Christ died for the church. Am I dying to myself with some of the things that she is wanting and desiring in his marriage. And, and of course the answer was no, but it was that first time that it really started to dawn on me that that maybe some of my own selfishness was contributing to the breakdown and demise of our marriage. But then I got to over, went to the Catechism of the Catholic Church to see what this church had to say about marriage because 10 years marriage, we, we thought we knew it all. <laughs> and then uh, article seven, paragraph 1601, marriage in God's plan again. And, and there it was God's plan. So I'm starting to read and, and literally for two days, Christine, I didn't go to work anything. And I just hold up in our bedroom, just reading and accessing this information. But that second evening, I called Julie into the room so that I could share with her some of the notes of the things that I was finding. And I said, look at this stuff. I said, you know, no wonder our marriage is messed up. We're not living our, our marriage like this. Look at this stuff. So I spent about 30 minutes overviewing with her some of the highlights of what I was finding. However, what I was finding in her is that she was just as much in awe as I was when I was discovering this information. In fact, she turned to me, she said, wow, this is incredible, what do we do? And instinctively I said, I don't, maybe we need to pray or something because at this point again, 10 years of marriage, we had never come together to pray outside of the Our Father at Mass or meal prayer. But I took Julie by the hand, we got on our knees and I went to God with a simple prayer. Father, we tried living our marriage based upon the things we think we should do, it didn't work. We try it the world's world, the world's way, it doesn't work. And we sincerely invite you into our lives to show us how you want us to live marriage. And if you deliver us from this evil, we will commit the rest of our lives working in some kind of marriage or family ministry. So the very next week we quit our corporate jobs. And here we are now, 22 years later, uh, taking what God had given us as we continue to read and study to learn more about his plan and simply started conforming our ways to the ways of what God intended marriage to be. And lo and behold, it works. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine. Wow. I had several questions and I did really good at not interrupting you guys with them. I was like, oh my gosh. So my first question, I want to do the superficial first. So were one or both of you in an active affair at that time? Uh, no, no. Just, just discovered uh, an affair Julie was in. And, and here's the thing, because when she shared that information with me, for some reason, I felt compelled to disclose my infidelities as well. And, yeah. uh, and so uh, I would say that, you know, God being the omnipotent God that he is, he knew exactly what he needed to allow to happen in our marriage to, to, to get our captive attention to be able to come back to right. him. So, well, what were you thinking, Julie? Now, my, my viewers, I've been on the air for over 10 years, well, almost 10 years. And I've talked a lot about the infidelity that we, that, you know, I had an affair, left my husband after four years of marriage for someone else. And, you know, we were apart for four years before we reconciled. And it was still very difficult until I learned what it took to make a happy marriage. So, uh, I mean, I've, I've crossed that line. But so the idea that if I would have just read a Bible verse, I've been doing standards ministry now for seven years, I think. Wow. And yeah. And many people see the word of God and dismiss it. And they're like, well, or they reinterpret it by their own perspectives. This is how I think it should be read. Right. My second question to you is kind of, did you feel the Holy Spirit at that moment? Like that seems like it was a true Holy Spirit moment that you both had your eyes opened at the same time. Yeah. Kind of take me into your soul at that time. Well, what was amazing at that point is because we were so broken and wounded, there was no further down to go. 
I mean, I can literally remember in those moments that I was on, on the bedroom floor in a fetal position crying and Greg had answered the phone and it was my mom. And I just always had this like, oh great, you know, now the guilt, the shame. I was the only one in my entire family that would ever mention the word divorce out of so many um, four generations. I mean, you know, I was gonna be that one. Wow. And I was just devastated, but I didn't know what to do. There was so much pain and so many wounds inside that it's just like, you just didn't care what took place. And I remember my mom calling and she said to Greg, just put it up to her ear. I don't have anything to say. I don't have any comments. I just want her to hear. I love her and I'm praying for you both. And I'm telling you to this day, if my mom or and dad or dad would have said, you need to come home. We need to come get you. You need to get rid of it. You need to get out of there. Right. The day that we said, I do, he was as much their son as I was their daughter. They got on their knees when they knew we were having problems. They went to adoration. They asked friends and family to pray for us. But the day that Greg called me into the room and he started teaching me, look at this stuff. Look at, this is God's plan for marriage. I can tell you, I still feel the flame that was burning in my, in my heart, in my soul. I, I wanted more. I, I literally felt in love with Greg. For that was my next question. As a woman, that's very attractive. A lot yeah. of, you know, fem feminists and liberals don't want to hear it, but even the most liberal of women understand that when a man takes charge, it is so sexy. It is so attractive. Yeah. Let's get past the sexy part, like just attractive. Exactly. And I think that's because God wired us that way. He is the head, you are the neck. And if he does a good job at being a good head, you have no problem turning your neck that direction. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. And I even say sometimes he's the head and I'm the heart. He, he, not, that one can't do without the other. The blood flows, the blood beats here yeah. to, to, pr to provide the oxygen for the head. One cannot do without the other. And I can recall everything changed. Everything that moment when he said, let's pray. I was like, what in the world? And I will tell you that there's so many times even today that I'll say, sweetie, I need you to pray with me. I need you to lead me. I need you to teach me. Because I remember 24 years ago when all hell was broke loose, literally there was no hope. In that instant, when he said, I think we need to pray, I was like, this man is this man is hot. <laughs> like he said, right. I mean, it's like, that's what we desire and that's yeah. what we're created for. And I know a lot of men aren't taught that, and, but in a lot of women, like I did, I usurped that because I was like, okay, if so you're not going to do it, I will take over and I will not let go. And so right. I was white knuckling everything for the longest. And I thought I was going to prove to the world that I was a woman and I was going to make a million bucks. And all the meanwhile, negating the very gifts that God had placed in my care was my husband and my children. Right. Yeah. How old are you? I don't remember. <laughs> 54. <laughs> so 56. Yeah. And so we grew up right around that same time where it's like, I can, I don't need you to hold that door for me. I can open my own door. Right. Not realizing that we found that actually attractive when a young man related to us or not, a stranger held a door for us. Right. Mm -hmm. so that was like, so we don't really know what it's like, what we want, just like men don't know what they need to do to be a man because we've, we've screwed all that up. Yeah, so it is important to hear that. I'm going to ask another kind of more secularist or, or temporal question first, before we kind of go deeper is that, um, so if you were having an affair and he said this, what happened to your thoughts or feelings towards the other person? Did that evaporate at that point? Or did you just make yeah. a decision to say, done no more communication absolutely it was before the the moment of him calling me into the room and all that and, and that was done and over and what was so sad is after the years of recognizing you always go back and go well, that wasn't even me how did I do that what I know who was that person we do. <laughs> yeah and I, and I know that we have our own free will yes but the devil is real and his little whispers and his little things that he puts in your head to make you feel like you're not worthy, you're not good enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not 
that there were so many issues in our life um, when we came together. E even this, we'll tell married marriage prep couples this, having sexual relations before marriage opens the door for That's two terrible. enemies, the enemy of lust and the enemy of lies and deceit. Well, look at there. We started our life, our marriage on a lie. Yeah. And so that steamrolled into this moment of all it took was some person to come up and made it seem like they were interested in me. And it was the other, it wasn't very long ago that I was reading in scripture. I don't even know where, thank God, probably I don't want to go back and look at it, but it was talking about prostituting our bodies or prostituting our ourselves. And I was like, what, a prostitute isn't someone standing on the corner. I was like, I prostituted my body, my soul, that my was meant baby. for my husband. Yes, because I just wanted to have attention. Right. I just wanted someone to notice me. I just wanted, how sad is that? I mean, so God wired you though. God wired. So I wrote my book, The Super Couple, a formula for extreme happiness and marriage. And there's a section in there called, I just want to be the center of your world. And mm -hmm. so it talks really about how when you were dating, um, no matter if it was short or not, anything you, you he finds out you like Reese's peanut butter cups he buys you a whole case you know yeah. he finds out your favorite color is purple he'll paint the you know everything is purple and they and you that's like oh my gosh look at it. it's like they call every two seconds so their your needs are being met mm -hmm. and then um when the love cocktail wears off it's called the love cocktail by the Gottman Institute I think it's the lust cocktail because it's yeah. all about the superficial stuff yeah. yeah but when that is worn off and because God said, you know, Julie, Greg, if you guys stay madly in love with each other 24 seven, you'll never go to work. You'll call in sick every day. You'll stay in bed. You'll never care about paying them. It's like, I'm so in love with you. I have to let those hormones wear down so that Greg can come out of his Julie funk. You know, this, this, this phase of like, okay, there is more to life than Julie and, and Julie to come out of her own. Right. And so that's when you go and fulfill the mission, Greg, that God had for you and Julie, the same thing. You get the job, you raise the kids, you do whatever. And so when that happens, when the 11 hormones go back to normal levels, now we literally have to make a choice to love the other. That's the verb instead of just the um, the animal attraction. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, when you, when you, when you break that, you all of a sudden are like, what, what the heck did I do? And why are you not paying attention to me anymore? And you used to do this, this, and this. So, um, you know, you touched on that, that I need to go back to being the center of your world, second to God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that reorders our, our, our lives and our marriage. I don't know if I just kind of went on a little rant, but you know, you're speaking, you're the truths of how God created women to be desired and he yeah. created, created men's structural and hormonal differences in our brains. Mm -hmm. He made the male brain with the structure and the hormonal differences are designed to fight, to conquer, you know, I'm gonna, ah, I see pretty lady. I win girl. <laughs> <sighs> and you know, and then once he checks the box, he's like, okay, now let me go to work and I'll focus on work instead of focusing on Julie, because I already got her, I'll just go work so I can pay her some bills, you know, just mm -hmm. buy stuff. So what you're saying is so important because what we don't realize is the emasculation of men and the yeah. over feministic way of yeah. women, like meaning to, to the radical. The emasculating of men Emas and the masculating of women. Yes, mm -hmm. there you go. Perfect. It, exactly. it, it just comes to the point then, then, then the men aren't, the, the warrior, the protector, the provider, and the women are the nurturing and the, and the, the loving and the, and the, the grace. And so look yeah. at, I mean, the, it just makes for just a, a, a atomic bomb, mm -hmm. literally when yeah. he's becoming more fragile and I'm becoming more manly. It's, it's like, it just, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. That's the way God intended. So it's amazing. So you guys are, how long did you date? Uh, we dated for about three, three and a half years before we, we married. We met in college uh, my junior year, her freshman year. It was just one of those things that that love at first sight kind of deal. And um, it, it started at that point. So you dated three years, married 10 years. The infidelity was in there various times. You've dropped your knees. You hit this prayer thing. What happened next? Did it? Did, were you guys happily married instantly? 
Uh, that's kind that, of a trick question. But... Really, it, it took about a year and a half of, of really kind of getting things to where they needed to be. But again, it goes back to what you talked about. We really began to see what love really was. It wasn't about the feelings. It wasn't about the emotion. It was about that ability to die to oneself for the sake of the other person. Yeah. And that it dying to those feelings or, or lack thereof that were not there, but still being in the relationship because there was something that brought us together. And, you know, despite the fact that we had gone to a therapist who suggested that we should divorce, we still stayed together because inherently there was that, that, that thing, if you would have brought us together, where it really wasn't so much that we wanted to be apart. It's that at that point, we had yet to find the information, the resources or the tools to make this thing work. And, and that did not happen until we started discovering God's plan. And it really started to come to understand that, you know, marriage is a sacrament. And there is a grace in the sacrament. However, many people are under yeah. the misconception that because we're Catholic, we got married in the church, now we have a sacrament, sacrament dispense grace, so everything should be great and wonderful. But what they fail to tell us is that it takes a participation with God in the sacrament to be made available to that full abundance of grace. The grace is there, but it's not accessible until we start living it the way that God calls us to. And I, I attribute to much of what we had began to experience in that 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 shields falling from the eyes and this new eye-opening experience was just that, coming now to live and, and be complicit with God in the way that he created marriage to be, that opened the grace, that allowed for that ability to forgive and to move forward and to do all those wonderful things associated with a, a happy, holy marriage. Wow. That was incredible. Yeah, was I fun. often tell people marriage is designed to make us holy not happy. If we go after happiness, we miss them both. If we go after holiness, we have them both. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Absolutely. It is amazing. Well, let's jump a little bit ahead because we need to get to how on earth did the Alexander house come? And then at some point you must've had a really good reconciliation because you went from two kids to seven, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're making up for lost time. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that's another part of the story because after our second child was born, uh, I was serving the United States Army at the time, and we went to Julie's uh, postpartum appointment, mm -hmm. and the doctor welcomed us in, oh, the Alexander's coming in, you know, I've been thinking about you guys, you know, you have a perfect family, you had your son, now you have a daughter, and one of you guys need to consider getting fixed. What? <laughs> your exactly. doctor said that? That, yeah. that was our response. I said, fixed doctor, animal? said, what are, what are you talking about? That's, isn't this animals? He said, well, let me explain to you the human version. So he went on to talk about Julie's option to undergo a tubal or how I could undergo a vasectomy. And so we began to kind of talk a little bit and, and very ignorant of our faith at that point, but coupled with a whole lot of selfishness because we started to think that, wow, when Lauren graduates high school, we're still in our early 40s. We can travel, we can make money, we can do all these great, wonderful things. You know what? You have the kids. I'll get the vasectomy. <laughs> and, uh, and so away we went and we had no idea the damage that we were causing our, our marriage at the time. And it wasn't until about 10 years later, discovering theology of the body and really coming to understand what God's plan and design was for the chastity aspect of our marriage as well to include the marital embrace. And after a lot of prayer and after a wonderful presentation done by Christopher West, uh, I felt compelled to, to have that vasectomy reversed. In a long sort of story, but a miraculous situation, we found a doctor in New Braunfels, Texas, who did it for pennies on the dollars. And um, nine months after the vasectomy reversal, uh, we can see, or we, yeah, can see Lola Catherine, who uh, we refer to as the incarnation of our reconciliation. Aww, <laughs> it was yeah. literally that fruit of that love coming back together. So pretty, pretty awesome. So, so we started realizing that we had friends and fellow parishioners that they too were just as ignorant about God's plan for marriage as we were. So we started doing these little talks in our parish. A DRE from another parish heard about the talks. She called you and asked if we had a workshop, which we didn't, but my beautiful little bride here lied. Yes, oh yes, we do. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like us to do it for you? Exactly. Tomorrow, how's tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> I know how that works, girl. You, you, yeah. you guys must be separated at birth. And that was her exact, when she came to me, she said, we have our first workshop. Guess what you're going to do, Greg. Right. I, I was like, we don't even have a workshop. What are you talking about? She said, well, you better come up with something. Because we got a date. Because <laughs> you're the head of this so marriage. We, oh so God. we went back and started just kind of over, what do we do to get this marriage back on track? And, and so we start presenting this workshop. And from the workshops, couples were coming up, wow, this is great. We learned a lot. 
do you work with couples individually? They're like, yeah, I took a page from her book. Sure, we work <laughs> yep, with couples yes. individually. What do you want to get together? <laughs> and so that started now what we call our, our marriage discipling process. And Christina, the last wow, 21 years now, Julie and I alone have worked with over 5,000 couples. And to date, there's only been 37 couples we haven't been able to help come back to a happy, holy marriage. And now I would love to sit here and say, wow, you know, I went back, I created this awesome program that's doing all this tremendous work and helping couples reconcile. But what we did was we gave the couples the same things that the Holy Spirit gave us. Because as we would continue to study and, um, and asking God to send the Holy Spirit to reveal to us how he wanted us to live marriage, I mean, systematically every day, the Holy Spirit was revealing these things in which now I've just been smart enough not to change. Mm -hmm. And we give it to the couples the same way the Holy Spirit gave it to us. And it's just been truly amazing to, to be a part of so many wonderful reconciliations. And, uh, and especially when there's children involved. And so that, that's what kind of started that. And we started in the last few years a training program because our, our desire is to have marriage disciples all over the world being there as a resource for many of these couples in those difficult times. And uh, maybe as you have experienced, and maybe you know, a lot of times going to traditional counseling does more harm than, than good. And, uh, and that's not to say that all counselors are bad. Don't, don't get me wrong. No, but, but I've a lot heard... of times based on I don't know of any. I was going to say based on the couples that we received. Yes. Exactly. I, I know the yeah. one that helped so. us uh, and it was, uh, she had a fantastic personality, but that's after going through four counselors, uh, you know, but mm -hmm. you were not here to bash counselors, but you're right. Even when people call me and say, do you know a good Catholic counselor in my state? I'm like, I don't know a good one in my state. <laughs> no, well, I know I, that's I not offensive. You, I apologize. Exactly. Sorry. With a hammer to home. Uh, oh, no, no problem. No problem. I was going to say to hammer the point home further, I have a very dear friend. Uh, I'll just call him Dr. Jim. And Dr. Jim, a PhD, marriage and family therapist guy, had, has a ther uh, practice now for 40 years. And I was talking to him. I said, Dr. Jim, I said, out of all the couples you see in marital counseling, how many would you say really need marital counseling? And, and immediately he said, oh, less than 3%. He said, 97% of couples I see need what you guys are doing. They're good, healthy couples. They don't have any pathological issues. They just need someone to hold their hands and show them how it's done. He said, that's why I love what you guys do. And so, so there is an appropriate area for the counseling, no doubt. But again, a lot of times couples are, are being uh, over counselized if that's a word. Can I use that word? Yeah. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> when, when, when they just, when they just okay. need someone to say, hey, here's God's plan. Here's how you do it. And, and quite simply, that's that's what we've been doing in that regard for the last 21 years. Yeah, and the grace of that, Christine, is because we what we see often is when when the couple is separated and one is worked on and not, and the and separately than the other, it, they're married. We bring them together at the same time. We we even fell into that trap a couple times at the very beginning, when we would hear one side of the story, we were like, oh my gosh, you live with a monster that that's horrible oh my gosh and then we talked to him we're like no wonder you're a monster because yes. what she's doing to you and so when we get them together and they become they they have to be honest and open about it but we are we are in awe we see miracles on a daily basis people's faces change i mean their their demeanor changes they come in and they're just like i mean literally they're like there's a wall a brick wall between them and after the first session we're telling them god's plan for marriage and we have them pray together before they get off at the end of the session, they're holding hands and crying it within an hour and 15 minutes because it's not us. It's yeah. saying, God, come and bring the Holy Spirit to this couple who is so wounded and so filled with things of the past and things of their family history and whatever. And we ask you, God, to come and show work with this couple. And he shows up every time we ask him to. You know, I mentioned earlier, you know, we take everything that the Holy Spirit gave to us to include different things that we had encountered. And much of what I attribute to quote unquote success that we achieve in our work with couples is based on three questions that we asked them in the beginning. The first question is, is this marriage something you want? And are you willing to do the things we will ask of you to help get it to where it needs to be? The second question, do you have the trust, faith, and belief in Jesus Christ that he has the power and authority to redeem your marriage and to get it where it needs to be? And I cite different examples and scriptures of how it was not only just Christ's ability to perform the miracle, but it was also hinged upon the faith of the individual. Of the, of the recipient. 
Yes. Yeah. And then the third question is, does God have your permission to come into your life and into your marriage and to allow for the changes that need to take place to and take place? Because of the fact that he is a perfect gentleman, he honors our free will. And if we freely choose for him not to be a part, he's hands off. And so therefore yeah. we need to extend that invitation and allow him to come in and to allow his graces to be there to help facilitate this process that brings us back together. And so, so again, those three things are critically important mm -hmm. because we need that buy-in from the couple to, to be there, but also to extend that invitation to our Heavenly Father, which he can be back where it is that we invited him to be at the wedding ceremony. Right. It's just that many times when we leave that church, we leave him there at the altar, but he mm -hmm. wants to be intimately woven into the So for people watching who've never heard about you guys before and you hear the Alexander house, is that like a physical house in Texas and only people can go through there? Or what are we looking at? If someone's going, I like these guys, I need help in my marriage. Do I have to fly down there? I mean, this day of Zoom, is this a computer program? Do I, have, what, what is it? What can they expect? Well, I'll start with this because when we first created the name, uh, we knew house had to be in the name because the home is where we should have learned much of what we came to know later right. in the first place. And uh, at the beginning, we couldn't think of another name. We're looking for all these Latin phrases and words mm -hmm. and things that we can put in there so it can sound all pretty. But we just settled on our last name. It really came to understand because it was in the Alexander house where we were revealed to these truths. And so it was from the Alexander house in which we would continue to evangelize those truths. And so yeah, many years ago, probably eight years ago, we started utilizing Zoom because we were getting calls from couples literally all over the world. Around the world and of yeah. course, with the COVID situation, we were already in the thick of things to just, just pick up and continue in that way. But for the last 21 years, we have been looking for that physical place mm -hmm. to, to have people, if they so desire, to come and see us in person. And interesting enough, about six weeks ago, uh, we, we ran into a facility uh, that we thought would serve as a good property to be able to build out that campus to allow couples to come in person to experience not only the marriage discipling, but a plethora of different programs and services to help continue to build the strength of marriage, but also, as a lot of our work lately, has been really helping couples really build that domestic church as well. And so uh, we, we found a place and I'm gonna let Julie tell you hopefully the short version as to how that materialized. <laughs> It'll be very short, I won't. But it, Greg was looking on the internet, of course, and found a place like four miles from our house and 10 and a half acres. And it's just absolutely amazing. It already has buildings on it. It has everything basically ready to go. Just a few things that need to be done. And we are just in awe. So long story short, we went to the, I'm trying to make it so short. We went to the owner and we negotiated a lower price than he had put on there. Go ahead. Yeah. What well, I was going <laughs> to say, because first of all, it. it's a million dollar property, over a million dollars, $1.4 million, I think was the asking price. And typically for a property like this, you have to show proof of funds, even to be able to come on and to view mm -hmm. the property in the first place. And the, But of course, we didn't have the funds. And in Julie fashion, just like she did with the workshop, she just went there. And it just so happened the owner was coming down the driveway in his truck. <laughs> so she flagged him down and, and went and shared with him what it is that we do in regards to the ministry and how we really felt called that that property was to be the place for the Alexander House. So long story short, she negotiated uh, with him uh, an offer of $1.3 million. And, um, and because we didn't have the funds, she convinced him to write a clause into the contract that give us 30 days to raise a million dollars. We know that God wants this so much. We know that we can raise a million dollars in 30 days. So <laughs> <It's> literally. <laughs> you know? And we have so, never done any of that. We've never, I mean, we've been a nonprofit for that many years, but we don't raise money. We don't like asking for money. We save marriages. Oh my God, exactly. And in four weeks, we have a million dollars. It is absolutely a God thing. We are blown away. And I kid you not, there is a long story to that, but I'll share that next time. I will do that when we're off literally. the air. Yeah. I'm yeah. And I literally said, to, I went up to a chapel, Immaculate Conception Chapel, and someone told me that I need to pray through Our Lady of Power. She's, it's in France in 1336. Beautiful story. But I went to her, knelt down and said, Mother Mary, I asked for your intercession. We have nothing. We have zero dollars. 
Please. Yeah, we've got seven kids. I just gotta yeah. feed them, man. We feed all these people at this retreat exactly. center. Exactly. I said so we you. have zero dollars, but I said what we do have is a desire to bring souls to Christ. Because we're so tired, Christine, of we're we're tired of hearing the oh well, there's another one. Oh gosh, how sad that that oh, child tried to take her own life because the parents are getting a divorce. No, are you kidding me? Not one more soul. Not one more soul can pass by yes. us and us not say, oh, well. I'm like, it's not a Greg and Julie problem. It's not an Alexander House problem. It's a world problem. It's yeah. a church problem. And we all need to work towards saving marriages. It's the foundation. And yet when you talk about marriage in this culture, it's like people don't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. It's like, it's like a bad word. It's like, what has happened? Because we haven't talked about it enough and we haven't seen enough good, positive examples in order for people to say, wow, the young kids, wow, I want, I want something, I want a marriage like that. I want a marriage like my mom. Yeah. I mean, it is something that we all need to be. I love what you guys were saying earlier. When we participate with God, then he sends the grace. Because we have so many Catholic couples that say, well, I go to adoration every day and pray that he'll change him. I go to mass and I offer my sacrifice and my communion so he can become the man I need him to be. Come on, God. And it's literally this whole understanding of God saying, Julie, go and hug him, go and love him, go and spend time with him, build him up and edify him. After he becomes the man I want, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. So read this deal, God. Gonna... Exactly. Exactly. And he's yeah. saying, no, because I died for you, even though you were still sinning. And oh my gosh, it just brings you to your knees. Well, the time. Israelites had to literally step toward, you know, into the Red Sea. Their toes had to be in it before the water split. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The water God. would not open yeah. up until they show that act of faith. Right. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, that act of faith. We have we have to believe and we have to demonstrate to God that we do believe. And when we do that, man, watch out. Because the, the grace oh. the doors open like a floodgate and, and just floods us with the grace. Well, so the, we one it. of our favorite quotes is from Mother Angelica. Unless you're willing to do the ridiculous, God will not do the miraculous. Wow. And I'm I've telling never you heard that. Yeah, it's beautiful. So last Thursday, we put our home on the market for sale. It sold in one day. I mean, literally, it's like this this hmm. steamroller of God just going, go. Are go. you going to move into the retreat center? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. So there, there's a house there on property. So we'll be able to work. I mean, because essentially, we do what we do all day, every day, uh, except for dinner with our kids. <laughs> yeah, well, I was going to ask you, did you guys have jobs outside of this? And then when did you come to the point where you're like, we got to quit our jobs? Or did you not? I mean, yeah, well, the first thing we did was we quit our jobs. when We realized that it was the worldly ways that was destroying our, our marriage and, and our individual lives and our relationship with God. And so uh, we started doing just some sales and marketing um, uh, consultant work just to, to bring in money. But uh, once we committed to do this, uh, four years later, we went full time. So probably for the last oh, 20, 19 years, we've been full time ministry and just being uh, able to survive off the generosity of others who've come to know and like what it is that we do, yeah, absolutely. which is why it was so amazing with, with this property, because, you know, it's not like we've had a big database of donors that we've been growing and cultivating throughout the years. It's just that we just went with a lot of passion sitting in front of people, sitting in Zoom sessions even, and, and painting the picture of the dream and, and really allowing people to know and understand there's, there's nothing like this that exists, uh, a Catholic yeah. entity that, that works to, to heal and strengthen troubled marriages. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things, Christine, and, and I, I, hate, I even have to say it this way, but we operate from the fullness of the teachings of the Catholic Church. I mean, we don't we don't skirt around issues or omit certain teachings. We it's the fullness of the faith because that's how God allowed we do it us the right way. to be built. Yeah. And we came to realize that hey, if we're gonna profess to be Catholic, we have to live and believe everything that the Catholic Church teaches. Yes. And uh, and that I think is probably one of the differences uh, from us and a lot of other efforts that are out there working in the marriage ministry. Yes. And, and if I can add that, I think it's important because I know I'll forget my brain is going every which way. But the other miracle that I want to talk about is because May 14th is the deadline for us to raise $400,000 to complete, to do the closing. And just two days ago, I was telling my friend about Our Lady of Power and she looked it up and her feast day is May 14th. <laughs> Oh. And we had no idea. Mm -hmm. So it's these wow. things that we see that on a daily basis, God is showing us. 
his breath, his life, his way, his, you know, living in his will is so, it's like beyond what we could ever fathom. And, and people look at us and go, well, why, why are you doing that? How, how can you guys do this? What are you sure? And each time we're both bold. Normally I'm the bold one, if you can't tell, <laughs> but this time he's been bold with me and he's been like, it's going to happen. No, this is going to happen. Why? Because souls are dying, perishing. People are perishing from lack of knowledge. They're dying physically and spiritually. Right. Not anymore, not as far as we can go. We will do whatever we can to bring one more soul to Christ. That's our purpose on this earth. We have to participate with God. And my goodness, if people only realized the difference in our children's lives, the two that were huddled in the corner, now married, beautiful children. They have children. We have five grandchildren now. I thank God every day that we didn't rip apart their lives because we were so stinking selfish. We didn't care. It was about money. It was about what we wanted. It was about me. It's about you. You go do your thing. I'll do mine. We're fine as long as we got this house and these cars and this. Eh. <laughs> it just makes me nauseous because that so yeah. much time and effort is wasted on things we won't do. We don't have anymore. And it's as if God was telling me that I've given you the gift of my son, Greg, and those children who are mine. Those are yours to steward. Yes. Oh, but God, no, but, but I need to go get, I need to go save the world. I need to go over here and do this. I need to go to all these Bible studies. And I need to go over here to church and I need to go with my friends out of town. Why are you stepping over the gifts that I've given you to run after something you were never meant to have? That's what I heard That's him say amazing. internally. And I'm like, I'm done. I'm done chasing my world, my ball around. And I need to be obedient to God. And in that he gives you a grace of such, like you said, that submission, not in a bad way. I'm under Greg's submission for him to love me like Christ loved the church. Right. That's what I'm, that's what I'm lifting him up in my prayer that he does what he said and promised God he would do to love and honor and cherish and respect me. Why wouldn't I support that? And if he doesn't have you doing it, I mean, you're like Aaron and her lifting Moses' arms when he, you know, when he let his <laughs> arms down, the, the battle, the Amaleks were winning, but when his arms were held up, he was winning, the Israelites got the best. You are, you know, lifting those arms, or as I, you know, you said that yeah. head and the heart, and I love totally secular movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Have you guys seen it? <laughs> yes, yes. This is such a good movie, Tula, I said, Tula, Tula, you know, why did daddy get to be the head? Tula, Tula, the man is the head, but the woman is the neck. Yeah. I'm like, if you're a good neck, that's how Eve got Adam to bite the apple. Oh, honey. Right. Yeah. <laughs> this, right? so, there you go. You're doing your job by helping turn him, but then he makes a decision and it's, yeah. ah, we could talk about God stuff, but that's the stuff you're going to do at the Alexander house and you are doing. Uh, when I heard about this, I thought, what great timing, because I didn't call you guys to say, oh, let me call them and help them raise money. But when I found out you guys were still raising money, I'm like, what a great opportunity Absolutely. to have you on the air, because you got a million dollars raised in 30 days, you need just 400,000 more. And so who would want to give money to you? Anyone who's pro-marriage, anyone who's pro-God? Uh, do non-Catholics come to the yeah. Alexander house? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we even have pagans come to the Alexander House. I'll share this story right quick. So uh, we got a call from a female uh, a few weeks ago. She was having troubles in her marriage and she attempted suicide. And so she was checked in the hospital for a 72 hour watch. While in the hospital, they were coming around, around one day with the book cart. And so she pulls the book off this cart, which happens to be our book, Marriage 911. She didn't finish the book before she left the hospital. And she was having dinner at her neighbor's house a couple of nights later. And she was expressing to them, wow, I found this awesome book. I was reading about this couple. We learned so much, but I didn't get to finish it. And uh, her friend Lisa asked, she said, well, can I ask what was the name of that book? She said, Marriage 911. She said, oh my goodness, that's our dear friends, Greg and Julie. I can get you in contact with them. And so we started working with her and her husband came to realize that, that she's not even baptized. And so uh, this Saturday, she is going to be baptized and brought into the, to the church or be made a Christian, first of all, not, not fully initiated, but at least being baptized and become a daughter in the adopted family of God uh, as a result of that, that finding that little book on the book card. That, that's God, right? I mean, it doesn't even make sense. We're no. blown away. Yeah, we're blown away every day. God is amazing. Now, what about her marriage? Is she, I mean, no, this, you just got a soul here. Is she 
interested in yeah. you know, getting her husband into yeah, yeah. yeah, so we, we're working with as a couple. So her husband was already baptized, so he's a Christian, but he was not going to church anywhere. So right. the first part was now to get her, her baptized, which we have been working with them as a couple in the process while she's been preparing for a baptism as well. And you make your mess your message. Had exactly. she, you know, been successful at that suicide attempt, but she, based on the darkest hour of her life, she found light. Yeah. And, you know, same with you guys, same with me, the darkest hours led us to right. God. So don't begrudge. What is it? Don't begrudge your small beginnings. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. God will take your mess and make it your message. If you will allow him to, how amazing is that? Yeah. So she's, she's already shared with us that she will be our, our number one volunteer at this facility because of what <laughs> the small part we played in her life already. And she wow. says, she feels indebted, which also is why she felt that she wanted to come into the Catholic church because everybody that has been there to offer assistance and help have all been Catholics. And so I, I thought that was a beautiful sentiment <clears throat> as well, seeing Catholics go outside of themselves because we're usually known to be these quiet, kept ourselves reserved, holy kind of people. But to see <laughs> Catholics actually engaging and reaching yeah. out and helping to bring people into the fold mm -hmm. is, uh, is beautiful and, and beautiful to be a part of that so much so that it impacted her so much that she knew in her heart of hearts that she too wanted to become Catholic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I, I live in the South, like you guys, I live in Virginia. And when people go, you're Catholic and you love the Lord <laughs> figure. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it's like that, that shows that we Catholics have done a bad job with this excuse of my private faith. Jesus never asked our faith to be private. He actually said the opposite. You go out and make disciples yeah. of the whole world, not just your next door neighbors, not yeah. just the person you have. You get out yeah, there. Yeah. And so it is awesome to see you two doing that. It's all because of marriage, mm -hmm. but that's just your slice of the pie through helping people's mm -hmm. marriages. You get them to God. Some people it's through their art, they get them to God. Some people yeah, it's yeah. through their auto mechanic business. They get you to God, but your job is to fill heaven. Awesome. And uh, how amazing is that? Let me ask you a couple of technical questions. So what do you need besides money? Do you need money? Do you need volunteers? Do you, are you pretty much okay on that so far? Let's get the money so we can get the building. Do you need people to donate supplies? Is there yeah, anywhere? It's interesting. Yeah, we're, we're actually putting it together a list now of some of the supplies and things that we will need to help as well. We're saying 1.4, the property is 1.330. And so the additional 70,000 is to actually get furnishings for the property as well. But uh, volunteers, prayers uh you know we know the power yeah. of prayer so yeah. even if you find yourself in a position where you can't give uh give a prayer uh offer a prayer and and also realizing that no donation is too yeah. small you know a lot of people seem to think that well i don't right. have 000, i don't have a hundred thousand i was like what well, doesn't take a hundred thousand and we have been preaching all along that it's going to take a multitude of many doing a little bit to, to make up the whole, you know, yeah. it, it can't come from any one person, nor do we want it from any one person because everybody needs to see the, the opportunity right. that we can all come together and help build God's kingdom for marriage. As you would yeah. say, it's not Greg and Julie, it's not the Alexander house. This is his kingdom. And we all as a communion of persons in this body of Christ need to come together and to, to lift marriage up back to the place where our Lord Jesus Christ considered it to be a sacrament. Yes, amen, amen. And I say on our on our website, we do have the vision and some videos. It would be very helpful if even those that donate or if they cannot donate, if they would pass it on to anyone they know. Get the get our the word out. Our circle is pretty small, but if we can get the word out to as many people as possible to forward it to to share it, that what would are be they forwarding? Important. Where's the website? www.thethealexanderhouse.org dot org you guys go to the alexanderhouse.org you can see a of course where to donate but b go and see how god is miraculously using these guys to 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 win souls go to the alexander house i was so blessed when i went to that website and i saw all that you guys are doing i mean i just i i could talk to you all day maybe we should <laughs> We should we'll go off the air, yeah. the two of yeah, us. But I, I think we'll probably be making a trip to Virginia soon. Yeah. Yes, like I got two spare bedrooms here. Yeah. I could take you to the beach and we could talk marriage stuff. You could speak to my people. I could speak to your people. It's a beautiful there thing. We, go. But we just need all of you watching to know if you know somebody whose marriage needs to be saved. 
If you know somebody whose marriage was saved, if you know someone whose marriage was never saved and you wish they had had the Alexander House, please, please consider giving time, talent, uh, treasure, your prayers more invaluable than every dollar they have collected. Because if you give your prayers, God will send the money. Amen. So it's, the prayer, and, and I know I've heard a lot of Christian people do that. Oh, just pray for us. And it sounds very shallow. It's not. Those mm -hmm. of us who really appreciate prayer realize that is the only thing that you will ever take with you. You die naked, just like you were born. But every prayer you ever uttered follows you into your judgment and it follows you into your eternity. And when you die and you turn around and the Lord says, look what you did. And you see a line of hundreds or thousands whose marriages were saved because you gave $5 or you prayed for the Alexander house. It will have eternal consequences. And so again, I, I want to stress the prayer, please. But also they do need money to help save marriages. Guys, is there anything else that you want to put out there before I ask you my ending question? Yeah. yeah, the only other thing I have to say is that if you do find yourself in a difficult marriage right now, don't, don't do what the rest of the world is doing and, and throw in the towel. You know, really get on your knees and extend that invitation for God to come into your life and for him to direct you to the appropriate resources to help you get your marriage to where it needs to be. You know, we find in the book of Malachi, God hates divorce and not because of divorce in essence, but because of the hurt and pain that is the result That's of two so people true. reneging on, on their, their marital vows, yeah. and especially when there's children involved because we are their marriage preparation. Yeah, and, and again, what, perfect what he said, the, the spirit of the understanding of the children in our own souls. I mean, when I come to the altar and I offer my everything to Greg and, and it, it's, it's, it's not a, a, something to take back. It's a covenant to last forever. We don't talk about that anymore, but we tell couples that come to us, he's like, well, I'm just leaving. I'm getting out of here. And we're like, be careful. Your soul is in jeopardy. When you do that, so he says anyone who children, divorces his about wife, our souls, yeah. Anyone who divorces his wife forces her to commit adultery and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Society doesn't want to hear that; they want to make excuses. No. But that's out of Jesus' mouth, not out of yeah. one of the prophets. Exactly, and that's a hard pill for many people to swallow. Look, I have seen a marriages with pornography be healed. I've seen marriages with addictions of every kind be healed. I've seen um, abusive marriages healed a man had you know pushed his wife down the stairs once and he got help and they had been reconciled for over 25 years Praise happily God. i have seen some tremendous god don't think any marriage is past that point oh but i can hear we go again i'm preaching just like you guys i got two things to say to you first question okay uh, first was not a for, it's a statement name one thing you'd have our listeners do differently as a result of something they heard today i don't care who goes first uh to close every night in prayer and to begin every day in prayer. Quick formula, right quick. Come together, physically hold hands before you retire. Husband, recite the Our Father. Wives, respond with the Hail Mary. And then each one of you taking a turn, noting a thanksgiving, our intention to God for your beloved. Mm. And I would say more, just more praise and thanksgiving to God every day. You know, we have a lot of complaining. We have a lot of fear. We have a lot of concern. We have a lot of angst. What we've run, recognized is in this time where sin abounds, grace abounds the more. Yeah. Ask for the Holy Spirit to come. Ask Jesus to send you the Holy Spirit, who is the paraclete, who will be with you until the end of the days. That will give you the, nur the, the strength, the courage, the joy, all those things that we need to live a happy and holy life. He will give it. You just need to ask in thanksgiving. Ah, uh, one last statement. It's fill in the blank. When I die. I will know I've made a different, I will know I've been successful if, when I die. When I enter the kingdom of heaven, I see my wife there because I've done what I needed to do to help her get to heaven. And when I beat him there. <laughs> when I beat him there. <laughs> And I would say, I, I've always envisioned this, but I said more for Greg and I both, but someone had shared this with me once and it was a beautiful facade of when you're running the race and you have souls on the sidelines, literally cheering you, come on, come on, you, you can make it, you can make it to the finish line, go, go, go. When those are lined up down the hill, across the valley, 
because we cared enough to help somebody else out of their misery and lead them to Jesus Christ. Amen. One last time, if you guys want to give to the Alexander House, help them have a physical building so they can continue to save marriages around the world. Of course, not them, but God through them, but he's using them mightily. Go to the alexanderhouse.org. No punctuation in there. The alexanderhouse.org. Give your time, give your treasure, give your talent. Most importantly, give your prayers. Julie and Greg, you've been such a blessing to me. I don't know. It took me so long to get you on the air, but thank you. Really appreciate you. Thank you. God bless you. Yes, God bless you. Thank you uh, so much. Well, I have to end the show the way I always do. I am Dr. Christine Bacon. You've been watching Breakfast with Bacon, and I want to remind you always to live your life sunny side up.